A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Second, The Golden Thread. Chapter Seven, Monseigneur in Town. Monseigneur, one of the great lords in power at the court, held his fortnightly reception in his grand hotel in Paris. Monseigneur was in his inner room, his sanctuary of sanctuaries, the holiest of holies to the crowd of worshippers in the suite of rooms without. Monseigneur was about to take his chocolate. Monseigneur could swallow a great many things with ease, and was, by some few solid minds, supposed to be rather rapidly swallowing France. But his morning's chocolate could not so much as get into the throat of Monseigneur without the aid of four strong men besides the cook. Yes, it took four men, all four ablaze with gorgeous decoration, and the chief of them unable to exist with fewer than two gold watches in his pocket, emulative of the noble and chaste fashion set by Monseigneur, to conduct the happy chocolate to Monseigneur's lips. One lackey carried the chocolate pot into the sacred presence. A second milled and frothed the chocolate with the little instrument he bore for that function. A third presented the favored napkin. A fourth, he of the two gold watches, poured the chocolate out. It was impossible for Monseigneur to dispense with one of these attendants on the chocolate and hold his high place under the admiring heavens. Deep would have been the blot upon his escutcheon if his chocolate had been ignobly waited on by only three men. He must have died of two. Monseigneur had been out at a little supper last night, where the comedy and the grand opera were charmingly represented. Monseigneur was out at a little supper most nights, with fascinating company. So polite and so impressible was Monseigneur that the comedy and the grand opera had far more influence with him in the tiresome articles of state affairs and state secrets than the needs of all France. A happy circumstance for France, as the like always is for all countries similarly favored always was for England, by way of example, in the regretted days of the Mary Stuart who sold it. Monseigneur had one truly noble idea of general public business, which was to let everything go on in its own way. Of particular public business, Monseigneur had the other truly noble idea that it must all go his way, tend to his own power and pocket. Of his pleasures, general and particular, Monseigneur had the other truly noble idea that the world was made for them. The text of his order, altered from the original by only a pronoun which is not much, ran, The earth and the fullness thereof are mine, saith Monseigneur. Yet Monseigneur had slowly found that vulgar embarrassments crept into his affairs, both private and public, and he had, as to both classes of affairs, allied himself perforce with a farmer general. As to finances public, because Monseigneur could not make anything at all of them and must consequently let them out to somebody who could, as to finances private, because farmer generals were rich, and Monseigneur, after generations of great luxury and expense, was growing poor. Hence, Monseigneur had taken his sister from a convent while there was yet time to ward off the impending veil, the cheapest garment she could wear, and had bestowed her as a prize upon a very rich farmer general, poor in family, which farmer general, carrying an appropriate cane with a golden apple on top of it, was now among the company in the outer rooms, much prostrated before by mankind, always excepting superior mankind of the blood of Monseigneur, who, his own wife included, looked down upon him with the loftiest contempt. A sumptuous man was the farmer general. Thirty horses stood in his stables. Twenty-four male domestics sat in his halls. Six body women waited on his wife. As one who pretended to do nothing but plunder and forage where he could, the farmer general, howsoever his matrimonial relations conduced to social morality, was at least the greatest reality among the personages who attended at the Hotel of Monseigneur that day. For the rooms, though a beautiful scene to look at, and adorned with every device of decoration that the taste and skill of the time could achieve, were, in truth, not a sound business, considered with any reference to the scarecrows and the rags and nightcaps elsewhere, and not so far off either, but that the watching towers of Notre Dame, almost equidistant from the two extremes, could see them both, they would have been an exceedingly uncomfortable business if that could have been anybody's business at the house of Monseigneur. Military officers destitute of military knowledge, naval officers with no idea of a ship, civil officers without a notion of affairs, brazen ecclesiastics of the worst world worldly, with sensual eyes, loose tongues, and looser lives, all totally unfit for their several callings, all lying horribly and pretending to belong to them, but all nearly or remotely of the order of Monseigneur, 
and therefore foisted on all public employments from which anything was to be got. These were to be told off by the score and the score. People not immediately connected with Monsignor or the state, yet equally unconnected with anything that was real or with lives passed in traveling by any straight road to any true earthly end, were no less abundant. Doctors who made great fortunes out of dainty remedies for imaginary disorders that never existed smiled upon their courtly patients in the antechambers of Monsignor. Projectors who had discovered every kind of remedy for the little evils with which the state was touched, except the remedy of setting to work in earnest to root out a single sin, poured their distracting babble into any ears they could lay hold of at the reception of Monsignor. Unbelieving philosophers who were remodeling the world with words and making card towers of babble to scale the skies with talked with unbelieving chemists who had an eye on the transmutation of metals at this wonderful gathering accumulated by Monsignor. Exquisite gentlemen of the finest breeding, which was at that remarkable time and has been since to be known by its fruits of indifference to every natural subject of human interest, were in the most exemplary state of exhaustion at the Hotel of Monsignor. Such homes had these various notabilities left behind them in the fine world of Paris, that the spies among the assembled devotees of Monseigneur, forming a goodly half of the polite company, would have found it hard to discover among the angels of that sphere one solitary wife who, in her manners and appearance, owned to being a mother. Indeed, except for the mere act of bringing a troublesome creature into this world— which does not go far towards the realization of the name of mother, there was no such thing known to the fashion. Peasant women kept the unfashionable babies close and brought them up, and charming grandmamas of sixty dressed and supped as at twenty. The leprosy of unreality disfigured every human creature in attendance upon Monsignor. In the outermost room were half a dozen exceptional people who had had, for a few years, some vague misgivings in them that things in general were going rather wrong. As a promising way of setting them right, half of the half-dozen had become members of a fantastic sect of convulsionists, and were even then considering within themselves whether they should foam, rage, roar, and turn cataleptic on the spot, thereby setting up a highly intelligible finger-post to the future for Monsignor's guidance. Besides these dervishes were other three who had rushed into another sect, which mended matters with a jargon about the center of truth holding that man had got out of the center of truth, which did not need much demonstration, but had not got out of the circumference, and that he was to be kept from flying out of the circumference, and was even to be shoved back into the center by fasting and seeing of spirits. Among these, accordingly, much discoursing with spirits went on, and it did a world of good which never became manifest. But the comfort was that all the company at the Grand Hotel of Monsignor were perfectly dressed, if the day of judgment had only been ascertained to be a dress day, everybody there would have been eternally correct. Such frizzling and powdering and sticking up of hair, such delicate complexions artificially preserved and mended, such gallant swords to look at, and such delicate honor to the sense of smell, would surely keep anything going forever and ever. The exquisite gentlemen of the finest breeding wore little pendant trinkets that chinked as they languidly moved. These golden fetters rang like precious little bells, and what with that ringing, and with the rustle of silk and brocade and fine linen, there was a flutter in the air that fanned St. Antoine and his devouring hunger far away. Dress was the one unfailing talisman and charm used for keeping all things in their places. Everybody was dressed for a fancy ball that was never to leave off. From the palace of the Tuileries, through Monseigneur and the whole court, through the chambers, the tribunals of justice, and all society, except the scarecrows, the fancy ball descended to the common executioner, who in pursuance of the charm was required to officiate, frizzled, powdered, in a gold-laced coat, pumps, and white silk stockings. At the gallows, and the wheel, the axe was a rarity, Monsignor Paris, as it was the episcopal mode among his brother, professors of the provinces, Monsieur Orleans, and the rest, to call him, presided in this dainty dress— and who among the company at Monsignor's reception in that 1780th year of our Lord could possibly doubt that a system rooted in a frizzled hangman, powdered, gold-laced, pumped, and white silk stockinged, would see the very stars out? Monsignor, having eased his four men of their burdens and taken his chocolate, caused the doors of the holiest of holies to be thrown open and issued forth. 
Then, what submission, what cringing and fawning, what civility, what abject humiliation. As to bowing down in body and spirit, nothing in that way was left for heaven, which may have been one among other reasons why the worshippers of Monsignor never troubled it. Bestowing a word of promise here and a smile there, a whisper on one happy slave and a wave of the hand on another, Monsignor affably passed through his rooms to the remote region of the circumference of truth. There Monsignor turned and came back again, and so in due course of time got himself shut up in his sanctuary by the chocolate sprites and was seen no more. The show being over, the flutter in the air became quite a little storm, and the precious little bells went ringing downstairs. There was soon but one person left of all the crowd, and he, with his hat under his arm and his snuff-box in his hand, slowly passed among the mirrors on his way out. "'I devote you,' said this person, stopping at the last door on his way and turning in the direction of the sanctuary, "'to the devil.' With that, he shook the snuff from his fingers as if he had shaken the dust from his feet and quietly walked downstairs. He was a man of about sixty, handsomely dressed, haughty in manner, and with a face like a fine mask, a face of a transparent paleness, every feature in it clearly defined, one set expression on it. The nose, beautifully formed otherwise, was very slightly pinched at the top of each nostril. In those two compressions, or dints, the only little change that the face ever showed resided. They persisted in changing color sometimes, and they would be occasionally dilated and contracted by something like a faint pulsation. Then they gave a look of treachery and cruelty to the whole countenance. Examined with attention, its capacity of helping such a look was to be found in the line of the mouth and the lines of the orbits of the eyes being much too horizontal and thin. Still, in the effect of the face made, it was a handsome face and a remarkable one. Its owner went downstairs into the courtyard, got into his carriage, and drove away. Not many people had talked with him at the reception. He had stood in a little space apart, and Monsignor might have been warmer in his manner. It appeared under the circumstances rather agreeable to him to see the common people dispersed before his horses, and often barely escaping from being run down. His man drove as if he were charging an enemy, and the furious recklessness of the man brought no check into the face or to the lips of the master. The complaint had sometimes made itself audible, even if that deaf city and dumb age that, in the narrow streets without footways, the fierce patrician custom of hard driving endangered and maimed the mere vulgar in a barbarous manner. But few cared enough for that to think of it a second time, and, in this matter, as in all others, the common wretches were left to get out of their difficulties as they could. With a wild rattle and clatter, and an inhuman abandonment of consideration not easy to be understood in these days, the carriage dashed through streets and swept round corners, with women screaming before it, and men clutching each other and clutching children out of its way. At last, swooping at a street corner by a fountain, one of its wheels came to a sickening little jolt, and there was a loud cry from a number of voices, and the horses reared and plunged. But for the latter inconvenience, the carriage probably would not have stopped. Carriages were often known to drive on and leave their wounded behind, and why not? But the frightened valet had got down in a hurry, and there were twenty hands at the horses' bridles. "'What has gone wrong?' said Monsieur, calmly looking out. A tall man in a nightcap had caught up a bundle from among the feet of the horses, and had laid it on the basement of the fountain, and was down in the mud and wet, howling over it like a wild animal. "'Pardon!' "'Monsieur, the Marquis,' said a ragged and submissive man, "'it is a child. "'Why does he make that abominable noise? "'Is it his child? "'Excuse me, Monsieur the Marquis. "'It is a pity. "'Yes.' "'The fountain was a little removed, "'for the street opened where it was "'into a space some ten or twelve yards square. "'As the tall man suddenly got up from the ground "'and came running at the carriage, "'Monsieur the Marquis clapped his hand "'for an instant on his sword-hilt. Killed! shrieked the man in wild desperation, extending both arms at their length above his head and staring at him. Dead! The people closed round and looked at Monsieur the Marquis. There was nothing revealed by the many eyes that looked at him but watchfulness and eagerness. There was no visible menacing or anger. Neither did the people say anything after the first cry. They had been silent, and they remained so. The voice of the submissive man who had spoken was flat and tame in its extreme submission. 
Monsieur the Marquis ran his eyes over them all as if they had been mere rats come out of their holes. He took out his purse. "'It is extraordinary to me,' said he, "'that you people cannot take care of yourselves and your children. One or the other of you is forever in the way. How do I know what injury you have done my horses? See, give him that.' He threw out a gold coin for the valet to pick up, and all the heads craned forward that all the eyes might look down at it as it fell. The tall man called out again with a most unearthly cry. Ted! He was arrested by the quick arrival of another man for whom the rest made way. On seeing him, the miserable creature fell upon his shoulder, sobbing and crying and pointing to the fountain where some women were stooping over the motionless bundle and moving gently about it. They were as silent, however, as the men. "'I know all. I know all,' said the last comer. "'Be a brave man, my Gaspard. It is better for the poor little plaything to die so than to live. It has died in a moment without pain. Could it have lived an hour as happily?' "'You are a philosopher, are you there?' said the Marquis. "'How do they call you?' "'They call me Defarge. Of what trade?' Monsieur the Marquis, vendor of wine. Pick up that philosopher and vendor of wine, said the Marquis, throwing him another gold coin, and spend it as you will. The horses there, are they all right? Without deigning to look at the assemblage a second time, Monsieur the Marquis leaned back in his seat and was just being driven away with the air of a gentleman who had accidentally broke some common thing and had paid for it and could afford to pay for it, when his ease was suddenly disturbed by a coin flying into his carriage and ringing on its floor. "'Hold!' said Monsieur the Marquis. "'Hold the horses! Who threw that?' He looked to the spot where Defarge, the vendor of wine, had stood the moment before. But the wretched father was groveling on his face on the pavement in that spot, and the figure that stood beside him was the figure of a dark, stout woman knitting. "'You dogs!' said the Marquis, but smoothly and with an unchanged front, except as to the spots on his nose. I would ride over any of you very willingly and exterminate you from the earth. If I knew which rascal threw at the carriage, and if that brigand were sufficiently near it, he should be crushed under the wheels. So cowed was their condition, and so long and hard their experience of what such a man could do to them within the law and beyond it, that not a voice, or a hand, or even an eye was raised, among the men not one. But the woman who stood knitting looked up steadily, and looked the Marquis in the face. It was not for his dignity to notice it. His contemptuous eye passed over her, and over all the other rats, and he leaned back in his seat again, and gave the word, Go on. He was driven on, and other carriages came whirling by in quick succession. The minister, the state projector, the farmer general, the doctor, the lawyer, the ecclesiastic, the grand opera, the comedy, the whole fancy ball, in a bright continuous flow, came whirling by. The rats had crept out of their holes to look on, and they remained looking on for hours, soldiers and police often passing between them and the spectacle, and making a barrier behind which they slunk, and through which they peeped. The father had long ago taken up his bundle, and bidden himself away with it, when the women, who had tended the bundle while it lay on the base of the fountain, sat there watching the running of the water and the rolling of the fancy ball, when the one woman, who had stood conspicuous, knitting, still knitted on with the steadfastness of fate. The water of the fountain ran, the swift river ran, the day ran into evening, so much life in the city ran into death according to rule, time and tide waited for no man, the rats were sleeping close together in their dark holes again, the fancy ball was lighted up at supper, all things ran their course. The End of Book the Second, The Golden Thread, Chapter 7 Read by Rick Kistner for